Crossroads Village, Old World, Wisconsin. Yeah, they were. We're standing just outside the brew house. It's a tall building with two chimneys, many windows, and skylights. Inside, we make beer using the techniques of Wisconsin's farmhouse brewers. Their tools were simple. Fire, copper kettles, wooden vats, and barrels for fermentation or storage. In a farmhouse brewery, family members work together. Located in Eagle, Wisconsin, Old World Wisconsin features buildings and homesteads from around the state in time period correct settings. This section is set up as an old town village, ranging in dates from the 1870s to the 1900s. Basically. Mm -hmm. yep. You purchased your seat. This is how our siding was on our house. Huh? Yeah. When we first got it, and it was this color green. Which is one reason why it really does remind me of. From the duck cloth? No, from, <laughs> from the seal. From I'm riding your hand. Sometimes I don't
cheese crushers around here. Those really look like coffee beans. Apple spins like that. No, because car- coffee beans are, um, yeah. Yeah, so these mm-hmm. are unroasted coffee beans. <laughs> so they keep better and they're unroasted. They haven't released the oil. So they don't taste as good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm right here. The center one, the center door right there, would have been the stairs, upstairs. The other door would have been like a another bedroom or a pantry or. Those are uh, lightning rods. Mm-hmm. Heavy breathing just coming up that hill. Boots and shoes. strap for deep mud. Need that in the boundary waters. Newport sandal. Imitation sandals. Wool lined. Oh, this is like, like maybe, uh, 
Hello. Shop. Uh, this is the workplace and home of Anton Sissel. It's set up as it would have been in 1885. So he would have also lived here with his wife and infant son at the time. He was a traditional shoemaker, but he diversified and also started selling machine-made shoes once the Industrial Revolution happened and started putting some demands on his business. So. Could you mention where the house was originally, or did I miss it? No, uh, yeah, it was from uh, Kiwani County, which is okay. yeah. 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 right to the south of Germany. Yeah. Yeah. He became a very versatile leathersmith over time. Yeah. <laughs> Wanted, dead or alive, no. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Oh, awesome. Welcome to the Four Mile House. Awesome. So this this building was built in 1853. And right now we're showing it in 1870s, though. Okay. That's why we have the temperance sign <laughs> on, which, if you don't know, temperance is no alcohol. Mm -hmm. We thought people thought it poisoned people's minds, so we tried to do these other things like tea, coffee, lemonade, and carbonated soda. So that's when the soda became popular, like Coca-Cola, all that kind of stuff. You have a token? Would you like one? Yes. We Actually, have two. <laughs> oh, she, two! She, awesome. She needs one. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'll just set them in the cup. So I have ginger ale, blood orange, violet, frosted mint, and strawberry. That is sugar free. I'll go with ginger. Ginger, beautiful. And while I hit fix blood orange. Up. Sorry, blood orange. Blood orange. All right. So yeah, this was actually carbonated um, water. Was the. Kind of drink of the temperate society, and at these boarding houses, which we're in, they would have um, at temperance meetings in here because it was like a big community space where they all got to go. And actually, the top floor of this building they would use for temperance dances and such. They would also have meetings in here, several meetings in this hall, not because it was a boarding hall as well as a meeting hall because it was a big community space. So when um, people would travel between each, some cities, it's shooting out everywhere. <laughs> they would stay in the rooms upstairs and they would also eat from the kitchen in the back. So, very interesting. Then, all right. We also have some other, we had some other groups that stayed and would like talk to each other and stuff like the <laughs> anti-theft horse group, anti-horse theft group. <laughs> Very interesting. But yeah, if you want to keep exploring, let me know if you guys have any questions. We will. <laughs> yeah. I like your kilt, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> You're not doing sample there. You can't be sampled, I'm sorry. You're not going to be sampled. Oh, okay. You're not going to be sampled. I don't want to switch. Try it. You can still explore. Yours is better, I will say that. Oh, wow, very good, yeah. Very much. <laughs> Like, I'm happy for the modern conveniences of the kitchen stuff, but I think some of the old stuff is cool. And yeah. They, like, need to bring back in maybe a modern version. Does that make you sad? It does.
Like a child sitting there high, you know? <laughs> Should take a header, it's her problem. <laughs> through the floor. I wonder if there's another uh, furnace down in the basement or a stove, wood burning stove. Hmm. Or if that was more for draft. Because you know what they had at the basement. Was the yep. All right. Um, Curiosity. Yeah. The stove in there, there's a stove pipe coming up through the floor. Is that because there is a wood stove in the basement that goes through the same chimney? <laughs> <or>? <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> Right. So the wood stove there yes. has a stove pipe that goes through the floor. So yes, in the original building, we don't have it downstairs okay. at the moment, but it was kind of with the structure, but it would have had a wooden stove down there. Okay, side. that's... Mm -hmm. Good observation, <laughs> I haven't had that question yet. <laughs> He's just that old, you know. <laughs> 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 I, I need the money. <laughs> so, try it. Of course, this is the room that's got all the key on it. Put your mouth in it. Just ring it right here. And then the other foot on the bottom of the stool. And then you get, put your foot on the pedal and push yourself up on the seat. Okay, now, the trick to this is if you keep your arms straight, bend them, and that you kind of look a little bit in front, not, not right at the wheel because it didn't. Turn, turn, turn. And, uh, off you go. Just, you'll do fine. You'll do fine. Look at that. Look at that. Okay. Come on. Oh, master the first turn. Look at that. Hi, guys. Oh, she's doing great. Right? That's okay. Right. It's okay. Keep the, you're looking in front. Don't look at the wheel. That's better. You know, people want to look at that wheel and see what, and then when you do that, you lose, you lose, uh, it starts wobbling. Okay, you're doing fine, doing fine. On the final straightaway, here she comes. <laughs> okay. You can push with your other arm. <laughs> I can't, it's so wobbly, I can't straighten it out. Right? No thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is this is how they did it back in 1900. Yeah, riding a bike in a kilt just probably <laughs> doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I better not. <laughs> better not go there. Right. So, well, thank you guys for coming. September 1876, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.
Die Maus. Richard Shakespeare. That's not translated. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, everything has to be translated on another page. How we live, or the human body, and how we take care of it. How digestion works. The blood gets purified. How the body moves. Sense of hearing. Smell. bathtub in there, a humidor, a little stand next to the bathtub. You're fancy. Right? ceiling. Wow. Check out the carving in the glass thing. Study. He's got the cigar case. So at some point, there would have been a stove like that in here. I think right about here.
So I mentioned apprentices before. So if you wanted to be an, if you wanted to become a blacksmith in the 1880s, you had to do an apprenticeship, which is similar to a lot of trades and crafts even today. You know, you still need apprenticeships for some things, um, which is also the case for a modern blacksmith. You still need to do an apprenticeship to get really good. Um, but when you were becoming an apprentice, you were probably between the ages of like 10 and 14. Um, and you had to move in with the family that you were um, working under. So the master blacksmith and his family is who you would be living with for the like six to eight years that you would be working under them. So you would have to live with them. And that created kind of a roadblock for women to become blacksmiths. So it wasn't necessarily unheard of. In Wisconsin in 1880, the census showed about 5,000 blacksmiths, blacksmiths total here in Wisconsin. And like between three and five of them were listed as women. So that doesn't mean that that was all of the women that were blacksmithing in the state. You know, the historical record can be a little muddled sometimes just because the census taker comes to your door in 1880. They ask you what your profession is. I mean, I don't have to tell them the truth. They're not from my town. They don't know me. They're not going to know if I'm telling the truth or not. So maybe my husband is a blacksmith, and I also do work in the blacksmith shop. And I would say that, yeah, I'm probably a blacksmith, but I'm just going to list myself as a homemaker on the census because I don't have to list myself as a blacksmith. So the number could be a little bit higher. It's hard to know for sure. But either way, not impossible. But as a 12 year old girl in 1880, you're not gonna move in with some random man in his family. That is just not gonna happen. And you know what, you probably wouldn't move in with a random man in his family today either. So it was a little more tricky for them to learn the craft. If your dad or your uncle was a blacksmith, that was a really great opening for you because that meant that you would be living with a family member still uh, able to learn from them. Same with if your husband was a blacksmith. Obviously, you're a little older when you're learning, but maybe your husband needs a little extra help in the shop. Maybe he gets sick. Maybe he drinks too much. So he needs a little bit of extra help, especially if he's no longer able to work. You still need to earn money and get things done. So if you were being an apprentice, the first few years of your apprenticeship, you probably weren't doing a whole lot of blacksmithing. So you were coming in, that master blacksmith is having you do a lot of the busy work that he does not want to do. So you're sweeping, you are bringing coal from the coal bucket behind you back there, up into the coal trough up here, maybe even shoveling it from the coal pile out back and bringing it inside. Um, you're probably moving stock around, maybe cutting stock, you're not doing a lot of the real work that you want to be doing. Is basically where I'm going with that. So you would have spent those first few years doing busy work, and then finally, finally, you would have learned how to blacksmith. And once you were done learning, and you had done your years of apprenticeship, then you would be called a journeyman. So journeyman is still a term we use for a lot of trades today, right? So it would have been the same idea. The Gretelution family would have been calling it your Wanderjahre, so you're like wandering year because they were German. Um, but same idea, you'd be able to travel to other master blacksmiths, learn the things that they were experts in. So maybe the person you learned from wasn't very good at one thing or didn't specialize in something that you wanted to learn. So you'd travel and talk to the, someone else. A good example for probably a little earlier than the 1880s is maybe the guy that you trained under is really good at making axes. You know, you're up in northern Wisconsin, Maybe you're making tons of axes and saws for those lumber camps up there. Maybe you don't want to make axes forever, so you move somewhere else to learn how to make horseshoes, things like that. And then once you have all those skills that you want to acquire, you can move on and make your own shop, become a master blacksmith yourself, maybe even take on um, apprentices of your own. So by the 1880s here, why I said that they probably weren't really doing axes, that was an earlier example, is because by the 1880s, Industrial Revolution is so far in swing that things are being made in factories. So you no longer have to go to your local blacksmith for a hammer or your axe or your saw or anything like that because you can buy the exact same thing that's factory made right across the street for way cheaper. So the, that dirty general store over there is taking all of our business and all of our money. Um, so no longer do you have to make all of those smaller tools and really, you probably shouldn't be anymore because that's not where your business is going to come from. 
Instead, what's going to make you a lot more money is learning how to do repairs. So repairing those axes, saws, hammers, tools that are being made in a factory and bought across the street because they're probably not as good of quality as what you can hand make over here. So you're going to have to learn how to repair those. And then as we get a little further towards the 1900s and into that 20th century, you're going to have to learn how to repair like more intense farming equipment. So those plows and things like that are starting to get more and more complex. You gotta know how to fix that too because someone's gonna bring that in here and if you don't know how to fix it, you're missing out on a lot of business. The biggest one and what the Greta Lucian family would have been doing is you would be doing ferrying. So you would be doing horseshoes, you'd be making them, repairing them, and attaching them to the horses. So we have a lot of horseshoes hung up in our rafters here. And what those um, horseshoes, those horseshoes would have been probably like each nail would have been a specific horse that was a client of yours. So the owner would bring their horse in, you would probably have a few of them already made up um, so that you didn't have to do quite as much work while the horse was here, you know, hooked up to the back wall of your shop on those rings. Sorry, I did a step without telling you. We just twisted, this is a bottle opener. So it's mostly done, I just put a fun little twist in it. So you would have a hook for each horse that was a client you would be able to reshoe their horses when they came in. Um, that way you wouldn't be making the shoe on the spot necessarily, especially like in winter or if you knew that it was like harvest season or plowing season, planting, you probably want extra shoes on hand because that ice in winter is gonna tear up shoes faster. Same with if you're, you know, your horse is plowing three fields in a week, those shoes are gonna be gone through pretty quickly. So I stuck it in the water, that's what cooled it off. So that's our quench bucket. It's just water in there. So that is a bottle opener. I'm gonna do that step kind of again. So I'll kind of talk you guys through this. So I have this piece, it's pretty hot. It's orange, you can see that. I'm gonna bring it over to this vice grip over here. I'm gonna grab it right there with our vice grip. I'm actually gonna try this this time. I haven't tried this on one of these. And then I'm gonna use this bar. Oh, it's so much easier. <laughs> That's what I used for hooks. I didn't think to use it for a bottle okay, opener. Where would, uh, where would they get their metal from? Uh, you would have to have it shipped in probably by train, um, most likely from like out east. So, you know, you've got all those steel cities coming up. You know, a lot of cities right. were doing all that. Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a lot in Pennsylvania in that yeah. area. Um, so getting your steel from out there. And they come um, like this, like this? Yeah, so they come in these really long pieces that are oh, against the back wall. So then we cut them down into smaller stuff. So you get that long stock. Um, we cut them down into those short pieces to make stuff like these and hooks. So what I'm holding right now, it looks the same as all of that cool stuff, right? Everything is cooled down. Do we think it's cooled down? No, certainly not. So this is what we call black hot. It's black, but it's really, really hot still. So it could still be up to a, like 1,000 degrees before it starts to really glow. So, I'm gonna dunk it in our quench bucket. I'm gonna leave it for a few seconds um, so that it can cool down a little bit. Really get my tongs in there too. That's one of the other hazards. Not only are you working with something hot, but because you're holding other hot stuff with other metal stuff, everything that you're touching is starting to get really, really warm as you go. All right, so there's another one. That one is all cooled off. It's kind of grimy, that's okay. <laughs> So there we go. All right, I'm going to start on some hooks probably. Yeah, so we have two different options in here. So we have our bellows. I'm not tall enough to reach the stick when it's all the way up there, so I need a hook. I can't get a really good crank on it. But So we have the bellows that can blow air in, and that is one option. I don't think that they work very well right now. I think no. something needs to happen there. So instead, I have a crank blower, which is what this is. So as I spin this, it'll also blow air into the forge. Do you guys have any questions? Not yet, no. No? Sorry, right, there's lots of tape. We've got all sorts of crazy equipment in here. We've got like several decades worth of innovation in here as well. Um, so the crank floor that I'm using right now is an 1870s version, um, where it's got you know the leather straps, not a lot of like no gear stuff happening. Um, if you've been to the blacksmith shop before today, 
this would have been hooked up. So this okay. should sit up here, but it won't be on the ground forever. It's gonna get moved to that back forge once the back forge is repaired. Um, but that's a 1900s version. So it came out like right at the beginning of the 1900s, gears and all that good stuff. Um, so this is just the precursor to that. Works a little less well, um, you know, innovation helped, but it was so smoky too. Wow. How long have you been doing black knitting? Um, about a year. So I started last summer. Um, I learned how to make hooks two summers ago. So I will say, or three, I don't even know. Two summers ago, <laughs> two years ago. Um, like when I first started working here, we learned how to make hooks. Um, but last summer I started doing the blacksmithing. So then I did a bunch over winter while we were closed. I spent a bunch of time in here in like February and March. Okay. Um, when my quench bucket was frozen still, so I just drop them on ice. Um, so I made a lot of hooks in the off season. We made like almost 300 of them okay. as extra stuff because when it starts to get busy here, we sell way more than we can make in a day. So nice to have spare items as well. So when you do stuff out here, is there a lot of like cross training or does, I mean, or do you get like stuck in one area and just stay there? It depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've kind of gotten trapped into blacksmithing all the time now because I know how to do it. And right now we don't have a ton of people who know how to blacksmith. Um, our like regular blacksmiths that do this outside of here and are trained on it, um, they're all either getting older, um, so they have you know grandkids and stuff that they want to hang out with and they don't want to be here every day, or one of our other blacksmiths who will hopefully be back for weekends at least this month. Um, he is an archaeologist and he's got all sorts of crazy stuff going on in his life. He's been doing a lot of state archaeology work in the past year, so okay. he's not here all the time. So a lot of our a lot of our blacksmiths have like other jobs that are like wild that they need to be at as well. But um, there are a few of us that know how to do it otherwise. So it just kind of depends. Most of the time though, you work in a lot of different places. I've noticed most people who learn a craft tend to end up staying there. Like the people who know how to do the wool stuff. Okay. It's like a, it's a very niche group that has been fully trained on that. So they're usually out there and they don't come into the village, but um, a lot of us that like know the cooking or like simpler things do move around a lot. Okay. So. So do you guys do like any reenactments as far as like Civil War-ish or? We, so staff does not do reenactments, but um, we do have an event called For Liberty and Union. It is towards the end of July where we have a reenactor group come in. I don't remember if they're Wisconsin or Illinois Regiment, but they are a Civil War group. Okay. Um, sometimes the rest of the year we have random times that we have reenactors here. Um, last year we had like a farming weekend where we had um, our like crafts and trades guy reenacts and so a bunch of his friends came out and did like a little camp out with farming stuff. So every once in a while we have reenactors. It's not super common just because we don't do a lot of first person out mm -hmm. here so like where you're pretending to be characters yes. so we don't do a lot of reenactment type stuff and i think they want to like s stay away from that too much but yeah for the for liberty and union event we will have the civil war okay i don't remember which regiment it is off the top of my head or which state really <laughs> I mean, I but during our um like seasonal events so our home for the holidays and legends and lore it's more of the like reenacty type stuff but um because then it's more of like, you know, shows and entertainment mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. of things. But, yeah, we have a lot more, like, themed weekends this year. So, okay. um, they should be, I'm assuming somewhere there is, like, a list of them. I know next weekend is Rhubarb Weekend, so. You mentioned, I know. Told you. <laughs> yeah, this weekend was Sheep Weekend, yeah. and next weekend is Rhubarb, so. I was no, walking through, growing. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, it's ready to be picked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm sure they're going to pick so much of it this week, and then we'll be working with it next weekend. So, 
Should be should be really something. We'll have soda water that's rhubarb flavored, which I'm a little afraid of. <laughs> it sounds interesting <laughs> enough to try though. Yeah, I would agree. It'll be something. Yeah, I don't know. I like that we're just theming a whole weekend off of it. Cause last year it was like we were all doing rhubarb anyways, but no one was promoting it, so. When it's in season, that's when you gotta, you gotta do it. Yeah, to use it to its most, I guess. I don't even know what I'm doing with this one. I think I'm making a hook now. <laughs> Find out. It's kind of that point in the day. Yeah, let it talk to you. Let it do right. what it wants to do. Exactly. Keep expectations to a minimum with it. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely.